Mike Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. In the bleak midwinter of 2022, it will cost three quarters of the state pension to heat your home. The gas and electricity bills this winter for pensioners will take three quarters of their weekly income. By April of 2023, gas and electricity bills in Britain will reach £7,000 per year or £140 per week. The poorest will be plunged into utter poverty. The incoming Prime Minister, Liz Truss, would rather freeze the people than freeze the prices and has today set her face against any further help to the poorest people in Britain. Meanwhile, Lord Richard Dannett, the former head of the British Army, has said in the Times that it is time for the army generals in Ukraine to tell Zelensky that they can do no more, that they cannot throw the Russians out. As Peter Hitchens, the right-wing conservative columnist, in the right-wing mail on Sunday today says the game is up, nothing but disaster for Britain and for the people of Ukraine can flow from continuing this idiotic war that was never necessary in the first place. And 60 years ago, this month, Nelson Mandela was arrested by the apartheid police and spent the next 27 years in prison, supported by MI6 and by the CIA. The United States only took Mandela off the terrorist list in 2008. And I myself saw Mrs. Thatcher's lips move and heard her say that Nelson Mandela is nothing but a common terrorist. Just think about that. Little Macron is chased out of Algeria. Perhaps the people there remember the massacre of their compatriots in Paris in 60 years ago. Algeria chased the French colonists from their country. Little Macron failed in his attempt to recolonize it this weekend. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride, Epstein and all, because it's the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Let me start with some housekeeping. Make sure that you are picking up our podcast. It's now being downloaded in 124 countries around the world. It's not yet back to the numbers it was when we had to close it down for financial reasons, but we are determined that it will be. Take note that on Monday, the 7th of November, the mother of all talk shows goes on the road. The mother of all road shows begins in Stockport in the Garrick Theatre on Monday, the 7th of November. Gayatri will have our camera. We'll be interviewing members of the audience. We'll be showing some of those interviews on the subsequent edition of The Moats. Take note that we plan to restart the midweek mother of all talk shows, financial circumstances permitting, on the 12th of October. Put that in your diary. And note that every Wednesday until then, The Galloway Show. Just me and Gayatri and one camera. 
no frills, but raw and unvarnished. The Galloway Show only on YouTube at 10 p.m. UK time on Wednesday evenings. It's racking up great number, six-figure number last week and growing. It will grow until Wednesday at least of this week. I mention little Macron because he was in Algeria for a reason. Not to commemorate the massacre of more than 100 Algerian citizens in France who were thrown in the River Seine when the Beatles were number one in the British hip parade. I'm not talking ancient history here because they were protesting against the brutal occupation of their country, Algeria, by the French colonists. I'm not talking about the million martyrs that the Algerian people gave in their world historic, heroic struggle to overthrow French colonialism in their country. That's not why Macron was there. Macron was in Algeria to beg Algeria, which produces 3% of the world's natural gas, to sell some of it to France rather than on the open market. Macron was chased out of Algiers by the Algerian masses who made my heart swell with pride. Vive Algerie! What a magnificent sight, this little two-bit moth-eaten dwarfish emperor chased out of an Arab capital. Would that all the Arab people had the spirit of the Algerian revolutionary people. They chased him and the police had to hustle him into his car to escape from the angry masses in Algiers. I take my hat off again as I have done all of my adult life to the people of Algeria. <clears throat> he was trying to get <laughs> gas from Algeria for the same reason that the French Foreign Legion has now invaded Yemen. I'm not making that up, though you almost certainly don't know it because it has had virtually no coverage in the mainstream media. The French Foreign Legion, that's right, beau geste and all of that. The people that were driven out of Algeria 60 years ago are now invading Yemen. Why? Because they want to help the starving Yemeni children? No, because they want to occupy a potential gas field in the eastern part of Yemen and use it to bolster the gas supply to France and to the European Union. Boy, they're getting desperate now. The Yemeni people will resist them. The French Foreign Legion will be chased out of Yemen like the British were chased out of Yemen like the French Foreign Legion were chased out of Algeria. The days of white European colonies are over. It's Mandela's anniversary. He went on trial and was sent to prison for 27 years with the full support of British, American and French white European colonist governments right up until 2008 when the United States removed the terrorist label from Nelson Mandela. And then they all queued up to deify him. They all queued up for selfies with him. They were even taking selfies at Nelson Mandela's funeral, the hypocrites. But some of us have got long memories. I am like an elephant. I am cursed with long memories. I'm cursed with the memory of being called a communist because I supported Nelson Mandela. The days of white European colonialism are dead and buried and the sooner white European countries realize it, the better. The only way to sort out your gas supply is to make peace with Russia. And that means to end your economic aggression against Russia and your endless military supply of weaponry to Ukraine. Don't take my word for that. Take the word of Lord Richard Dannett, the former commander-in-chief 
of the British Army writing in the Times of all places this very day. This is awkward because the Times has been telling its readers for the last six months that Kiev was winning the war and bigly and their hero Boris Johnson was in Kiev. Where else would he be? He wouldn't be on the beach at Dover trying to repel the 1,652 borders coming across in rubber dinghies every single day last week. No, he wouldn't be in Rotherham. He wouldn't be in any of those towns where our young girls have been so grievously sexually abused systematically for decades with the police and the politicians doing nothing about it. Of course not. He wouldn't be on the old age pensioner estates in Britain explaining to them how they're going to live when three quarters of their weekly old age pension is going to be spent on their gas and electricity bills this winter. Where else would he be? Of course, he's in Kiev telling Zelensky not to negotiate with Russia, to keep the war going, to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. This is awkward for the times that the former head of the British army says it's time to end the war. It's time to negotiate with Russia. It's time for the generals to tell Zelensky that they can do no more. It's awkward. This is not Galloway telling you this on the mother of all talk shows. This is the former head of the British Army telling you in the Times today. The game's up. And no matter how much money, weapons, and propaganda we continue to spew out of the pockets of our own taxpayers into the treasury of Zelensky, some of it, of course, ending up offshore, that will not change the final outcome. Although the final shape of a settlement has changed with every single day of the war. I want to tell you something that, you, again, you probably haven't thought of. You keep hearing the word billions. You keep hearing the word billionaire. And many people have begun to think of a billion as they once thought of a million. Well, let me tell you something. One million seconds is 12 days. One billion seconds is 32 years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. I want you to get those numbers in your head. One million seconds is 12 days. One billion seconds is 32 years. And then I want you to count up. How many billions of US taxpayer, European taxpayer, British taxpayer has been sent to Ukraine? I'll tell you how many. That's 78 billion has been sent to Ukraine to make war against Russia. 78 billion. Now remember, a billion seconds is 32 years. That's what you have spent. Our economy has been destroyed by our own leaders who on the back of the COVID catastrophe, the lockdown debacle, disaster, have now spent a fortune of your money that they didn't even have. They printed the money and bankrupted your economy in order to make war against Russia. When they could have solved this entire matter by merely implementing the Minsk II agreements, which they signed and guaranteed France and Germany, are the guarantors of the Minsk II Agreement. What did the Minsk II Agreement require? It required a declaration that Ukraine would not join NATO and that Lugansk and Donetsk would have devolved 
government like Wales or Scotland. That's all. But of course, so much blood and treasure and bad blood and international political poison is now coursing through the veins of this entire matter that the terms of a settlement have dramatically changed. But Lord Dannett is insistent they will have to be negotiated and agreed. Someone asked me in good faith today on Twitter if I would set out what I thought were now the terms of a political settlement. He's not going to like what I'm going to say. And many of you won't like it. And it might not even be accurate. But my take now is that Russia will now absorb the eastern half of Ukraine, the southern coast of Ukraine, and will require a new government in Kiev. They will insist on the southern coastal plain of the Ukraine linking up with Transnistria and the hundreds of thousands of Russian people living there under threat from Ukraine on one side and Moldova on the other side. Sharif is their football team. They're playing Manchester United in the Europa League very soon. Look out for them. They've got a statue of Lenin outside their stadium. That will leave Western Ukraine as a landlocked NATO protectorate, exactly like the NATO protectorate in what they call Kosovo, which is in fact the NATO-occupied part of Serbia. It will be an endless source for you of bills, of crime, of prostitution, of people trafficking, of illegal weapons. And by the way, the Pentagon has just launched an inquiry this day into the failure of the Ukrainian regime to properly track the billions of dollars, billion, 32 years of seconds, billions of dollars of military hardware sent to Ukraine by Western countries and the tracking, according to the Pentagon, which is now investigating it, has been so insufficient that anyone who knows the way to the dark web can today buy a javelin missile to put in the boot of their car for just 23,000, it was 25, it's now $23,000 for a javelin. You can bring down an airliner with a javelin. You can blow up a bank vault with a javelin. You can cause devastation by terrorist attack on any target anywhere in the world with a javelin in your boot, $23,000. The whole kit and caboodle. So not only did the so-called Western taxpayer pay for the weapon in the first place, Criminals and terrorists are buying it to use against Western targets right now. Again, don't believe me. Believe the Pentagon, which has just launched an inquiry into it. So that's what I think will be the terms of the ending of the war. But if these terms are not agreed, the war will go on. And something like the final lines which I have just drawn for you, or worse, will be the outcome for Kiev and for Western Ukraine, as it will come to be known. So, given that this war has cost the lives of uncountable Ukrainians, the blood of their soldiers is running like rivers, Everywhere in the country, Lord Dannett says they've comprehensively lost the war and can do no other. And given that it has devastated, bankrupted, bankrupted your economy, isn't it time to end the endless media 
lies that Ukraine is winning one more heave, one more billion, ten more billions into the maw will do it. Boris Johnson is more welcome in Kiev than he would be in Dover. More welcome in Kiev than he would be in Hare Hills in Leeds where the gangs are fighting each other with machetes on the streets in broad daylight with not a police officer in sight. Mind you, if they were, they'd be wearing new hats specially designed for non-binary police officers, like the pictures of the Northern Ireland Police Service that I have just seen today. It warmed the cockles of my heart. I remembered the RUC over so many decades of my life, and I thought of them now in their non-binary hats. I told you to fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a bumpy ride because it's the mother of all talk shows. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Maria Farmer, one of my favorite guests, though she can be a little wild at times. I ask her in advance. Not to libel anybody on my show because I simply cannot pay any libel fees. But Maria Farmer is one brave lady. She was the original Jeffrey Epstein victim, survivor, whistleblower. She has done more than anybody else to bring the sheer horror of the Epstein Maxwell gang to a wider audience. And as such, She's come across quite a few dead bodies. Another one popped up this week. Stephen Hoffenberg. She was the last person, it seems, to talk to Stephen Hoffenberg. Let's hear from her about who he was and how and why he's now dead. Maria, welcome back to the show. Always wonderful to see you and hear you. I saw you in all the worst newspapers this week. Yes. The Hoffenberg tale. Tell the viewers about it, please. Sure. Um, I would first of all like to say that um, Stephen Hoffenberg was truly uh, the kindest man I've ever known. And I've, I've you know, known a few men in my life. And he was uh, a, a true, genuine soul. He cared about anyone who had survived Jeffrey Epstein so much. He cared about... Um, all the victims of Tower Financial. He cared about all the victims of Wexner. He was working with um, uh, one of the Wexner victims, uh, George Tonks, and they were going to be coming forward. And he's actually going on today on another show. Uh, you can follow his YouTube. Um, and he's going on Carbon Studer, and it's on YouTube under George B. Tonks. And he's going to be discussing a lot of the Wexner and Epstein stuff today. Um, but basically, Hoffenberg was someone who was uh, there for us and the whole time. I, I've known him a while, um, but I've, I've been very, very close. I became very close to him when I became ill. And he, he called me every single day to make sure that I was well. And he really cared. He didn't want anything from me. I tried to do things for him. And he was such a, a, a humble and gracious gentleman. He, he would never let me you know, do things for him. So I showed him my love and I told him that I loved him. But I just have a lot of regret right now because I wish I'd told him more. Um, he really suffered the effects of the Southern District of New York, which is um, 
really unfortunate because, of course, I told this guy, Ed Shanahan, that wrote the New York Times article, which really butchered uh, the memory of Hoffenberg and also the truth of him. Um, Hoffenberg was somebody who had made a lot of life changes, and he made no excuses for falling for Jeffrey Epstein's um, antics, basically. He was very embarrassed that he was a part of it. He he was promised by the Southern District that he would be testifying against Jeffrey Epstein. And then they pulled him in and indicted him and they never arrested Jeffrey Epstein. So I've seen a lot of my friends have this happen where they're involved with Jeffrey Epstein and Jeffrey Epstein gets the final word, right? And these people end up dying or they're imprisoned or their lives are ruined or they have cancer. Now, look, I'm sorry that his death uh, grieved you so, uh, but it has to be pointed out, he spent yeah. many years in prison as a financial fraud. He defrauded countless people of their savings. He was a Ponzi scheme scam artist. And the only mitigation is that he claimed he was put up to it by Jeffrey Epstein. How credible is that, Maria? Yes. Um so he was he was busy working on other projects and i think he was embarrassed that he wasn't really um the person that was overseeing things properly jeffrey epstein had had two prior ponzi schemes and um hoffenberg never had one but as soon as hoffenberg worked with epstein he had a ponzi scheme so it's just everyone around epstein ends up falling it's really interesting are you there I think I, I think they lost. I'm here. Oh, here. Uh, I'm here, and I, I, I just wanted for balance to uh, set the record straight. Uh, he uh, he committed egregious fraud against a large number of people. I'm asking you, how credible is it that uh, Epstein done it and ran away? It's very credible. Okay, so here here's the thing. What people don't understand is Jeffrey Epstein was a CIA agent and CIA agent. I reported a CIA agent to the FBI. Brad Edwards writes about it in his book. Brad Edwards is one of our lawyers and he writes about it. And basically um, Jeffrey Epstein continued to remain unscathed while all the people that were his scapegoats ended up suffering. I was one of them. You know, I, I didn't go to prison, but I went into hiding. And it was all, we were all around the same time period that we were suffering. So it is very, it's, I'm not saying that Hoffenberg said he had no part of this. He feels very, he felt very culpable and guilty. And um, he was making every effort he could to be the best person he could to make a difference for the lives of other people who had suffered Epstein or um, the people who had, were affected financially by Epstein's crimes. And I happen to know he called them and, and worked with them to help them. So. Now, uh, what's uh, the latest on his cause of death? He died alone, I think in Wisconsin, in his apartment there. He'd been dead uh, mm -hmm. for some days. Uh, how did that happen with uh, such a high-profile man? Okay, that's a wonderful question. So the Southern District of New York is the answer. So what happens is the Southern District of New York chews people up, and when they spit them out, they're not able to survive. And he was living, he was destitute. He was living in poverty, and he was doing good for others. He was living in Connecticut, and um, I spoke to him five days before I made the, the call to the police. I had not heard from him in five days. And as a result, I was on the phone with my friend Carmen, and uh, I, looked at, I looked at the phone and recognized it had been five days that had passed, and I had never gone more than two without speaking to him. And I suddenly knew he was gone, and he had been suffering um, the effects of just a lot of health issues from being in prison so long and that's really the cause of the death it's not so sensational but what happened is uh, the police wouldn't go and do a welfare check they said that ponzi schemer does not live in our jurisdiction this was in derby connecticut and so i suffered a, a stroke that's why i'm in the hospital because i couldn't convince them to go and they finally went and out 
it's so undignified to have a body lying there. And that's what was really bothering me is I wanted him treated with respect at the end because I love him. And he wasn't treated well. The medical examiner called me um, that evening and she was very kind. And she said, listen, Maria, we're going to do all we can. But he's been dead for a while. And I knew, she said, when did you last speak? And I said, it was five days ago before, before Saturday. So it was nine days before they checked on his body. So <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, did I hear you correctly? Are you talking to me from hospital? And have you had a stroke? Yeah, I had what's called a TIA. I had two of them. They're, um, they're mini strokes. And um, for some reason right now, if I get really upset because I have this, uh, I have this superior vena cava um, issue. Let me see if I can find it. Um, anyway, basically I'm butchered. My vein was butchered by UAMS, a hospital. And um, so as a result of it, if I get very upset, I get like choked out and I can't um, get oxygen to my brain because the superior vena cava provides the oxygen through the blood to the brain. And so I'm going to suffer strokes if I cry. And I was just starting to, you know, um, I knew, I knew he was gone. And I was trying to explain to the Derby police officers to please go check on him and that they wouldn't do it. And so, yeah, I had a stroke. It was a mini stroke is what they call it. And um, now I'm in the hospital. <laughs> so. Well, I'm especially glad that you took the time to talk to us from hospital. I apologize for not saying so in the beginning. I did not know it. Maria Farmer, as always, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Coming up, we've got Lindsay Snell. Uh, but let me uh, do some uh, of the texts. Thank you so much for the super chat donations. We've got a fighting fund going so that when we relaunch the midweek mother of all talk shows, we don't go um, backside up uh, uh, within uh, a few weeks. We need a fighting fund to relaunch with all guns blazing. And people are kindly donating. Tony Bond, for example, has donated 10 pounds and says, looking forward to the meet and greet in Stockport, George. Can't wait to shake your hands. Thank you for all your efforts. Come up to me and say the name's Bond, Tony Bond. Thanks very much, Tony. Look forward to seeing you in Stockport on the 7th of November at the Garrick Theatre. It's a great theatre, really terrific. And you might be filmed and appear on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, Simon C66 donated one pound 79 pence. Thank you, Simon. Elvis is in the building and donated five pounds. Uh, Remembrance Rug Guy donated 50 American dollars. My goodness, thank you so much. Says, hi, ku, once upon a time, Uncle Sam, no clemency, history does rhyme. I don't know what that means, but I'm very, very grateful for your donation. Sailing Prepper Dark Secrets donated five American dollars and says, my favorite Sunday show, Galloway, keep up the good work as long as God gives me breath. Osama Al Mullah donated 20 US dollars. Thank you, Osama, and says, freedom of speech is sacred. Keep it up and never bend the knee. I bend the knee only before God, Osama, as I'm sure you know. Now, if you are having trouble calling us from abroad, try this new local London number. As far as I know, it's free. 0044-203-966-2625. That's 0044-203-966-2625. That's from people in countries other than Britain, and the United States, Ireland, and Canada. They can be contacted through the following numbers. If you're in the US, plus one, 844-944-3344. That is plus one, 844-944-3344. And if you're in the UK or Ireland, it's 08081-965522. Everywhere else in the globe, 
and we're being watched tonight in more than 100 countries and territories around the globe. It's 0044203966 Now we've got a poll going. My goodness, that's big. Uh, in the pre-poll, on the community poll on uh, YouTube, more than 5,000 people voted. And they voted overwhelmingly no to the following question. Are you prepared to pay for the Ukraine war through increased energy prices? A, yes, 9% on Twitter. Who are these 9%? Why don't you call up and say why? Please. Unless you're not allowed to phone from Broadmoor. Yes, 9%. No, 91%. And on YouTube, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It costs nothing at all. And 44% of you have still not subscribed. All you need to do is click a button. On YouTube, it's yes, 5%. No, 95%. And on Telegram, that's t.me forward slash George Galloway. It's yes, 3%. No, 97%. My goodness. You can vote on that until the end of the show. Give me a quick break, won't you? Let's play a game and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Listen, watch, and share the fastest growing political program in the world! It's for you, sir. Where's the cheese pizza, Robinson? Come on, what are the public paying you for? Oh, and uh, get another virgin colada while you're there. There's a good chap. No, who's ringing the old uh, burner phone? Hello? How did you get this number, Ghislaine? No, 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 that's impossible. I, I can't possibly fly to New York. Why? Uh, our mummy's grounded me, oh, yes. Certain to cut off my allowance, you know. Y yes, yes, I, I know it comes from the public, but uh, she holds the strings. Oh, I've uh, got to go. Uh, my, my pizza will be here uh, any minute. I'm not sweating, you're sweating. Ghislaine, don't call again. Robinson? Sir? Come here with that moist towelette. It's getting a bit hot for my liking. Here? Where am I? Welcome to St. Peter's Gate, my son. Is this one of that Hillary's tricks, that devil? Be still, my son. The Clintons cannot hurt you here. You are safe with me in heaven. Oh, heck. Knew I shouldn't have taken Bob's homemade vaccine. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I am not worthy. Before you pass on, you may ask any question you desire. Anything? With my omniscient knowledge, I can tell you anything you wish to know. Well, Lord, you got to tell me. All powerful creator of this universe, before you judge me, I've been searching for answers my whole life. Yes, my child. I have to know. Who shot JFK? Ah, ah, another one. It was a lone gunman by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. He was not a government agent, and there was no second shooter on that grassy knoll in Dallas. My God. This goes higher up the window! 
You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Two tweets side by side catch my eye. One from David Peckish. No, Pekzek. Sorry, P E C Z E K. And it's a quote from the great Oscar Wilde from The Soul of Man Under Socialism. It reads, To recommend thrift to the poor is both grotesque and insulting. It's like advising a man who is starving to eat less. Exactly what Liz Truss, Britain's next Prime Minister in just a couple of weeks' time, actually did today. And the other, cheek by jowl, says Joe Biden's daughter said that her dad showered with her inappropriately. The FBI confirmed it today. This is the sitting president of the United States. How is this not a huge story? Well, it's the first I've heard of it, but my goodness, it ought to be a huge story. Maybe it will become one. Who knows? A bit like Hunter Biden. That was Russian disinformation until it was proven to be true. Now, Lindsay Snell is a distinguished journalist, a very distinguished journalist, a Murrow Award winner, who specializes in the very areas that have become the center of world events, the Ukraine, Russia, and the uh, former Soviet states, Soviet satellite states, Russia's near abroad all of which are powder kegs right at this moment. And I'm very, very glad that Lindsay has agreed to join us now. Lindsay, very nice to meet you. I've been an admirer of your work for a long time, but this is the first time we've had the opportunity to talk. I don't know if you heard my opening uh, monologue, but uh, if not, in Precy, the game's up uh, for the war according to the former head of the British Army, Lord Richard Dannett, writing of all places in Rupert Murdoch's Times today, in which, inter alia, he says, it's time for the Ukrainian generals to tell Zelensky that they can do no more, uh, that this war will have to be brought to a quick end by negotiation and compromise. Uh, what do you say to that kind of analysis. It's absolutely correct. Um, it's hilarious to think that Zelensky isn't fully aware of this because he is, uh, as he's fully aware of the neo-Nazi issue and the corruption issue. But um, it's it's months too late, but it's absolutely necessary. And also there are SPD MEPs, German MEPs, who have said the same thing. It's time to negotiate. It's time to end this. Well, not just because of the suffering in Ukraine, and we'll, of course, turn to that in a moment, but the European economies are rapidly going bankrupt and facing, unless I'm a, a, a ludicrous uh, optimist, facing widespread civil unrest in their countries. How can people pay? three quarters of their pension on gas and electricity. How can people pay more than half of their income by next April on gas and electricity? Whilst food prices are rising rapidly. Nobody can do that. So our own economies are being defuncted by our policy towards this war. Something's got to give, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, this is months too long at this point, but it's time to end it. Um, there are, beyond the economic harm, uh, Ukrainians are dying in mass for no reason. You know, soldiers are underarmed, undersupplied, and they're just being slaughtered. I mean, like five soldiers showing one AK-74, basically, against Russian tanks and artillery. It's just absolutely ridiculous. It's time to end the war. Do you think the generals... Uh, do you think Lord Dannett's comments today reflects what the generals are telling him? Is the sense that the top brass of the Ukrainian army are 
close to the point where they'll have to tell Zelensky this? I think it's been well known uh, for a long time, although there have been reports, some soldiers have said that they told their command that, you know, we can't hold these positions anymore, especially in the Donbass. We can't hold these positions with one rifle and we're just being shelled constantly. Um, and their command said, basically, if you leave, we'll kill you sit there. In some cases, they took away some of their weapons for coming in to ask for support and help. So, I mean, it might be more beneficial for them to keep the lie going. But I think everyone in Ukraine, including Zelensky, knows it's time to end the war. That there's no chance of militarily now, winning this. What, what would the end of the war look like, uh, Lindsay? It goes without saying, although a surprising number of people haven't grasped this that what the end of the war would have looked like before the war began is very different to what the end of the war looks like six months into it. It's negotiations and it's, you know, probable territorial divide. And there's no way around that at this point because Ukraine has lost so much territory and they're steadily losing more territory. So, I mean, it's just a question of how much territory, how much more territory will they lose before negotiations are forced and a war, an end is, is reached. But how much territory, what territory uh, is likely to have to be ceded by Kiev in order to bring the fighting to an end? A lot of the soldiers in Donbass think that Kiev has already given up on Donbass, and that's part of the reason that they're so underarmed and undersupplied. They're just sort of sitting there waiting to lose territory, waiting to die, or... I, I mean, they think that that's already basically been ceded. So there's a good chance that that will be ceded. And right up to the River Dnieper, and right down to the Black Sea coast? That remains to be seen. But the longer this goes on, more territory will, will be absorbed by Russia. And what about the continuation in office of Zelensky? It's very hard to see how Russia could coexist uh, with the current regime in Kiev. Maybe these generals will have to come to power themselves. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to see. Also, there's a huge divide of much of the military, much of the Ukrainian military, especially the, the far right factions, of which there are many and they're among the most powerful, really despise Zelensky and don't want to follow his orders anyway. So it's, it's really hard to see how Zelensky factors into the end. And what's the impact uh, in Ukraine's near abroad, Lindsay? Uh, what's the impact on, on Poland, for example, uh, which of course has long had uh, territorial ambition uh, in Western Ukraine, indeed had sovereignty in Western Ukraine uh, for uh, 100, 150 years. Uh, what's the impact on the Baltic states? How much radicalized have these Baltic states become? The Baltic states have become absolutely insanely radicalized. And you can look at Latvia for chief examples of this. Um, really rapidly outlawing the Russian language in schools and 15% of people in Latvia are Russian speaking exclusively. Um, they've threatened to pull the passports and render stateless people who express what they deem to be support for Russia. And this is common in, in many of the Baltic states. Um, it's really, they've legitimized Russophobia. It's become completely acceptable. Well, uh, the, the United Nations has demanded a halt uh, to the destruction of historic war memorials uh, pending uh, review. Latvia has gone on what can only be described as a wrecking spree of memorials to the people who fell under Nazi occupation and during the liberation of Latvia from that Nazi occupation. Yeah, and this is something that they've waited to do for a long time. So it's not like these are just ideas that occurred to them because of the, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is something that they've been waiting to do for a long time. And not only that, you know, they still have, it's legal for them to do the SS Waffen Memorial Parade every year. That's still completely legal. But if you were to carry a Russian flag to a Soviet monument or even go and try to lay flowers at a Soviet monument, this is now a crime in Latvia. So it's, it's quite a, a crazy situation. 
And what about in Russia itself? Uh, Putin's approval rating, uh, at least according to uh, local opinion polls, uh, I suppose they could be questioned, but uh, it seems undoubted that uh, Putin's approval ratings are likely to be in the range uh, that the polls show, which is 82% approval. I think certainly the Russian population is tired of the war and the Russian population wants the war to end. It causes you know, additional complications for the average Russian, especially in terms of we're seeing travel in the EU now. And I, I don't think that there's any chance that Schengen visas will be completely banned for Russians, but it's becoming more complicated and more difficult to travel for Russians. And of course, the, the banking issues. I think the average Russian is, is very tired of the war and wants it to end, but still completely supports Putin. Of course, the average Russian doesn't travel to the European Union, nor, uh, nor shop in, uh, in some of the ritzier Western shops that have closed in, in Moscow. Uh, the average Russian doesn't have a yacht and, and doesn't holiday on the, on the Riviera. Uh, it's undoubtedly true that the oligarchs uh, have every reason to be angry about the uh, extent to which they have been effectively robbed uh, by Western countries, L legal, legalized theft uh, of their resources. Is that likely to become a factor in Russian politics? It may, but it hasn't thus far. And I mean, even countries that were particularly friendly to Russia, like Montenegro, have started seizing assets too. So I think it really depends on how far it goes and how long this continues. Well, I, I, I just heard yesterday that West Africa is now the port of choice uh, of uh, the Russian oligarchs. I'm not sure why or how much they'll enjoy it in, uh, in West Africa, but any port in a storm, I suppose. Interesting. Lindsay Snell, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, now, uh, Roger Asai donated 71 US dollars. Roger, thank you so much. And says, happy 71st, Steve. He's donated 71 dollars. It's his 71st birthday. It's quite some time, Roger, before I reach 71, God willing. But I'm happy to wish you many happy returns. Sometimes it's like we're listening to this George fellow together and laughing at the same spots. 27 years and I am still missing you. Uh, that's Roger speaking to Steve. And it's true. Uh, people uh, tell me uh, that uh, they, they listen, as it were, in concert with other people and then check back uh, with their friends and, uh, and discuss the show afterwards. Thanks, Roger, and happy 71st, Steve. Ivan Walker donated five pounds and says, we, the people, can do better. Demos poder. Ivan, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, described the spectacle of Labour members of Parliament, not many of them, but a few honourable souls, appearing on picket lines with striking railway workers as performative politics. Yesterday, the same Sir Keir Starmer dressed up from tin hat to hobnailed boots in a military uniform. Now, I know Keir Starmer. If there is any man less likely to be comfortable in a military uniform, I speak as someone who can strip an SLR and then put it back together again in the dark, having greased it along the way, I don't think Sir Keir Starmer would even know what greasing it meant. Scouse Alarm, my old pal whose wedding I attended last weekend, sends £4.49 from his honeymoon. Thank you very much, Liam. And says a small contribution to the Moats Fighting Fund, George. Your voice is so needed 
in these dark times. Thank you very much. Best wishes to you and your bride. Now, uh, Paul Cormican donated five pounds and Dulce Perl Perculum donated five pounds. Paul Cormican and Dulce Periculum. That sounds Latin to me. I'll get checked what it means. My Latin is not what it was. Now, in uh, the last guest in the show is coming all the way from Indonesia, from Bali. Indonesia declared today that it is going to join the BRICS. Argentina joined the BRICS today. Saudi Arabia is giving urgent consideration to joining the BRICS. A new world is hoving into view. And Carl Zha, who writes on China, he is uh, the host of Silk and Steel, who's a writer and a broadcaster par excellence and a very popular guest, is getting up at 3.25 a.m. in the morning in Indonesia just to talk to us on the mother of all talk shows. We'll be talking about China where American warships entered the Straits of Taiwan today, where the Chinese Navy sent four score of warships to the territory of the breakaway illegal regime in Taipei, where the Chinese are rejecting this ritual humiliation the United States is offering them. With the visit of Pelosi, whose husband was sentenced to a jail term of, I don't know, three or four hours for being triple the alcohol limit just the other day. And it's not yet clear who the passenger in his car was. He or she has not been named. The sending of US warships immediately in the wake of the Pelosi scandal, which cost the American taxpayer 92 million pounds, because of course the American taxpayer has nothing else that that money could have been spent on. There are no problems in the United States. But here is my main point. Everybody imagines that China is just waiting for the United States and its NATO allies to go too far. But what if China decides to act preemptively? It might, you know, if I was in the Politburo in Beijing, I might even be saying that there will, might never be a better time when the United States and the European and British economies were on their knees, where they were overextended militarily across the world, and where their military hardware is turning up on the dark web, except where it is being destroyed in its box as soon as it arrives, and where the military performance of NATO's number one ally, Ukraine, has proved so bad that the generals want it all to end. Clarence M. donated £10 and says, thanks for keeping it real, George. Tell it like it is, as very few do these days. Thank you, Clarence. And Matt donated £10 also. He says, U.S. warships sailing around Taiwan. Is Biden so crazy to support Kiang Kai-shek Kuomintang Club on this island because of the chip industry? Well, Pelosi's son has quite a bit of financial interest in that. Robert P. donates five pounds and says, Did you notice all experts, analysts on BBC News are always from Washington-based think tanks spewing imperialist nonsense. It's comical. Robert, candidly, I did not notice, 
because I have not watched the BBC apart from Match of the Day. I'm paying an entire BBC licence fee for Match of the Day. Just think about that. I would sooner poke my eyes out with a pin than to watch BBC News. Anybody who watches BBC News is a fool, is being fooled. And uh, Rouleau donates five English pounds, thank you for that, and says, look, let's look out for one another this winter. Look for the hungry. Ask people if they are okay. Love to all of you. Rouleau, I appreciate those sentiments, and of course, with my own neighbours, we'll do exactly that. In fact, the way things are going, they might be asking me if I'm okay. It's been six months since I was able to earn a wage, but candidly, asking if you're okay is not going to be enough. People have to stand up. They have to get out on the street. They have to get out on strike. They're being offered 3 and 4% when inflation is going to be, in real terms, 20%. They're being asked to cut their wages by 17% and condemned when they go on strike. People are going to have to rise up peacefully, but rise up. And uh, Cooler King 74 donates two US dollars and says, hello from Kentucky. Hello, Kentucky. Hello, all my friends in the United States. After the break, it's your calls. Stay tuned. Peter says, the Afghan people have lost, George. I thought you were better than this, to be honest. Give me a call, Peter. Tell me what you mean. And Oliver says, for some reason, George was on the jihadist side when it came to Yugoslavia. And that's the reason I will never trust him. I fought against the war on Yugoslavia with all my breath and all my heart. Me and Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn and others were practically the only people in this country opposing the war on Yugoslavia, the destruction of Yugoslavia. How dare you, you imbecile? If you have any guts, you'll pick up the phone right now and call this show and justify that utter slander. Really. And uh, Yoda says, love the show, best entertainment and education on the airwaves. <laughs> Ignition. Lift off. Lift off. 30 minutes after the hour. We need to uh, acclimatize the public uh, for the introduction of extraterrestrials because, come to the conclusion at this point, if they're going to come, they are going to come soon. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, they actually saw the saucer land in front of them or pass by in New York or go overhead. It went in front of my eyes up and turned into a, what looked like a star way up in the sky. They said the same line that you just made, and it was amazing. It is an awful waste of space. If, if we are all if that there is. If we are all that there is. Exactly. Have you ever seen any of these phenomena? I have seen um, energy entities. One looked like a massive jellyfish. The other one looked like a massive centipede. Well, you had me up to that point. Now I just think you're stark raving mad. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, for this final hour, it's mainly your calls, plus our guest, who is still in the land of Nod, but will be woken up by us at 3.25 his time. But for most of this final hour, it's over to you. Here are the phone numbers. If you're in the US or Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. We want to hear from you. If you're in the UK or Ireland, 
It's 0808196552. We want to hear from you. Uh, but if you're anywhere else in the world, including New Zealand, uh, the number is 0044203966265. And that number is on the ticker right now. And Sylvie in New Zealand just called it. That's why she is the first caller of the evening. Sylvie, welcome. What would you like to say? Well, thank you, George, for taking my call. Um, I just want to talk about the political situation in Australia as regards Julian Assange. Uh, Julian's yeah. father and brother went about three weeks ago with a small group of supporters to Parliament House in Canberra. They had with them two copies of Nels Meltzer's book, The Trials of Julian Assange, A Story of Persecution. They were refused entry into the chamber by security on the grounds that any material carrying Julian Assange's name was regarded as protest material and was banned. In order to gain entry, they were told to surrender the books to security and they could pick them up when they left. They then had to submit to having their bags searched before entry, unlike other visitors, such as many lobbyists who were there. On the same day that the Shiptons visited Parliament, Green Senator David Shoebridge raised the issue of Julian Assange in the House and was told by the Government Minister Farrell that Australia was not a party to the extradition case, which was just a matter between Britain and the US. Now, if it had been an Australian being held in Egypt or in Iran or in China, then we've seen how differently the government has reacted. Many people in Australia, no doubt, voted for Albanese and the belief that he would do the honourable thing and fight to bring Assange home. Now, immediately after his election, he actually met with Biden at the so-called Quad, which is the US-Australia-India-Japan summit, which was held in Tokyo, where he strongly reaffirmed Australia's commitment to the US alliance. He also had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Biden, and afterwards, when he was asked about Assange, he has said he won't be carrying out megaphone diplomacy on behalf of Assange. So we were all hoping that this meant that he was going to get the job done by using quiet diplomacy. But three months have passed now, and Albanese has shown no indication that he has done anything at all or indeed intends to do anything. In other words, Albanese's quiet diplomacy looks like just a code for no diplomacy, but with lots of photo shots. And whenever he is questioned on this, he has shown himself to be openly hostile to Assange supporters. I and, and those who voted for Albanese on the understanding that he would support Assange have been totally betrayed by him. That's really why. Well, uh, none support. of that, uh, none of that surprises me, Sylvie. Uh, I hope we're both wrong, uh, but uh, I wouldn't trust a Labour politician in any part of the world uh, to hold the leash of my dog, and I don't even have a dog. And I wouldn't let Albanese uh, out to do anything of importance for me and expect that he would carry it out. Uh, he seems already to me to be just one cheek of the same backside in Australian politics. But I hope we're both wrong. It is possible uh, that... Uh, there is quiet diplomacy going on. It is possible uh, that some kind of Australian intervention is going on, uh, but it's increasingly unlikely. It is 
a miserable tale of betrayal, of treachery, uh, and even the journalists who are now weighing in. Le Monde Diplomatique has just published a brilliant article. Ten years too late. Ten years too late making the point that the persecution of Julian Assange is pregnant with enormous negative implications for journalism, for investigative journalism, everywhere in the world, across all media. Ten years too late. Too little, too late. Good as far as it goes, but it's the 11th hour and 59th minute now. Julian may be on an aeroplane any day, never to be seen by any of us again. God forbid, I hope uh, that the courts will avert it. I hope the new Home Secretary, which definitely will not be pretty Patel, will take a fresh look at the case. I hope the Albanese will turn out not to be the rat he's already looking uh, to the rest of us. But as we say in Scotland, Sylvia, hey, my doots, I have my doubts. Tony is in Liverpool, government occupied city. Go ahead, Tony. Good evening, George. Hope you're well, mate. Well, well, mate. Well, go ahead. OK, um, regarding the European Union, uh, the sanctions backfiring spectacularly, particularly on the UK, EU and Anglosphere countries um, who all jumped on the shark um, when it came to the sanctions regime, which was imposed, uh, apparently to take down the Russian economy. Uh, we, we, they thought that they would de-invest the Russian economy. Well, what happened was they vacated the uh, scene and China, India and various other countries are buying up the businesses that they vacated uh, for top and tapening. Um, we're also seeing huge pressure, political and financial pressure on the European Union and on the UK. Uh, we've seen articles in Bloomberg which are stating now categorically that the sanctions that were imposed actually were superficial, have barely touched the Russian economy. The, the ruble is stronger than ever. Uh, the euro is less than a dollar in valuation. It's tanked. Um, Martin Lewis, who you will know, and people in the UK will know, is now predicting that the gas cap will reach £10,000. But what's to worry about? Well, look, uh, I, I don't think anybody but an idiot would any longer deny, Tony, that these... Sanctions constitute a gigantic boomerang, a gigantic rock that the Western economies, Western governments struggle to lift only to drop it on their own feet. Only an idiot would now deny that. So what we've got is Boris Johnson in Kiev saying uh, not only that we have to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood, but that we in Western countries will have to suffer mm. economic depredation, energy poverty, fuel poverty, food poverty, as a price worth paying to defeat Russia when the former head of the British Army states in the Times today, Russia cannot be defeated. So talk about a double whammy, Tony. Absolutely. We cannot uh, defeat Russia, but we're going to break our own backs in order to defeat a Russia that cannot be defeated. Absolutely. There's the sense in that, Tony. Yep, they jumped the shark, George, and they've got hold of the shark for dear life. They can't let go now. They're all in. In for a penny, in for a pound. We also seen in Germany this week, George, the German defence minister... Uh, and foreign minister, uh, they're actually admitting now that they've expended so much munitions in Ukraine that they've actually, you know, dwindled down their own stocks and they don't have a massive manufacturing basis in terms of munitions um, and that, that applies to the rest of the European Union. So now they're actually weakening mm. themselves for any potential war. Yeah, it would be any, a any... good time. It would be a good time to invade Germany. They don't have any, any, any money or any weaponry left. There's, there's no way, George, there's no way that NATO is in any fit state whatsoever to take on Russia. It's as simple as that. 
Russia alone. Never mind Russia, maybe, China, maybe Iran. Maybe France. Maybe France could invade Germany and to kind of even things up. After all, Germany invaded France three times in uh, in less than a hundred years. Uh, thanks, uh, Tony, for that. Kamran Jawed donated one pound. Don't be shy about donating one pound or one dollar. If you all did that, the midweek moats would already have taken off. Truth Searcher donated twenty pounds making up for the 19 others that haven't yet donated. Truth Searcher, thank you very much indeed. Ian Robert Houghton donated £3. Thanks, Ian. And Matt Bryant donated £5 and says, Thanks, George. Keep it up always. I would give more, but I'm saving up for a hot shower. Thanks, Matt. I did hear that you needed one. No, I don't mean that. But think it could be worse, Matt. You could be in Germany where the state has issued guidelines to the public in the richest country in Europe, in the powerhouse of Europe. The state has issued guidelines that in the morning, rather than take a shower, use a washcloth. Takes me back, I must say, to my attic single room where all of us had to use a washcloth in a single sink because there was no bathroom and the toilet was outside on the stairs. But mind you, that was 65 years ago. You'd have thought we'd have come on from that. Now, uh, Jamie is in Malaga. Let's hear from Jamie. Always welcome, Jamie. Oh, th thank you very much, George. And I'm, I'm a very big fan of yours and watch your program every Sunday and, and, and really find it very, very interesting and, and relevant. If only thank more you. people were, were, were listening. Um, and, and you've already got a lot. I'm not diminishing that, but, but I wish the whole of the world were listening. Sure. It would be a better place. Um, Indeed. Uh, I thought that the woman, uh, Sylvie, from New Zealand, spoke very well about the appalling treatment of uh, Julian's father and brother in Australia. What, a, what an absolute sham that whole thing is and disgraceful. In their own country. In, the, ex in their ex own country, by their own parliament. Exactly, exactly. Utterly disgraceful and what a letdown Albanese has been. Um, as you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big supporter of, uh, of Julian Assange's and he's still in solitary confinement into his fourth year in a maximum security prison in, in England, in London, Belmarsh. Um, the reason I wanted to call today is about a man, a young man, who started a walk in June from Hamburg uh, on the way to London to Belmarsh Prison. And uh, he's quite an incredible person and he's got a, a, a big following. But I really wanted to do a sort of call out uh, on your show was just to encourage people to look him up uh, on Twitter uh, it's called Long Walk for Assange, as in Long Walk, and then the number four for Assange. And he's actually reached uh, Brussels. He's gone through Brussels at the weekend and is now on his way to, to Calais. But an incredible person, and I've been following him on Twitter and seeing all the sort of uh, um, people who've been receiving him in different towns and, and celebrating his arrival and uh, as he goes on with his sort of uh, cart that he pulls all his possessions um, or at least all of his possessions for the, for this journey. But um, incredible, incredible person, an incredible response, and he got a very. What's good his name? What's his name, uh, Jamie? His his name is Kolya. It's uh, it's K O L J A, but but spelt uh, pronounced Kolya. And he's well. Got, everyone uh, should look out for him and follow him mm -hmm. on Twitter, on social media, and if you see him. You give him a cup of tea, give him uh, a lunch, uh, give him a pat on the back, cheer him. This sounds like a heroic, epic uh, journey. When is he due to arrive London? Well, uh, my calculations are that he'll get to London around about the 10th or 12th of September. Um, and he's now on his way between uh, Brussels and Calais. And Because he, I talk to him pretty much every day. 
and he thinks he'll be in Calais in sort of five days from now, Pro- probably sort of get to Dover. If, if anybody was thinking about coming to Dover and perhaps walking with him for a while, I mean, that would be brilliant. He'd probably be, get to Dover sort of the 5th or 6th of September. Um, and, yeah, that, that's fantastic, George, uh, you know, a sort of call out to him. And well, look, uh, God bless him. God bless him and God bless you, Jamie, for uh, all of your efforts. After the break, it's the aforementioned Kalza. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere, where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Gartry sends me some great uh, messages. I'm sorry I don't have time to read them all out. Uh, This one from Tony. Zelensky will bleed the West dry before fleeing to Florida or being dealt with by his military planners. The European and Anglosphere economies are doomed due to Russian sanctions backfiring spectacularly. As I say, Tony, only an idiot could any longer deny that. So they're reduced to saying... The price is worth it. The last person to say that was Madeleine Albright, currently resident in the seventh circle of hell. But in that case, the price was worth it because she, we, were not paying it. It was being paid by dead Iraqi children. This time, these are the first sanctions where we are actually paying the price. And Brindle Style says, if the truth is against the law, the law is broken. Well said. Kieran Hill says, our leadership won't be paying the same price though, GG. They will have their heating on. Indeed they will, Kieran, and we'll be paying for it. The taxpayer paid for the heating of the stables for the horses of Zahawi, the cabinet minister, who's on the television telling us we'll have to sanction ourselves and ration our use of heating. Yeah. And Paul Stevenson says, Craig Murray put it best, quote, the neolibs had free reign in the West since 1980 and have been increasingly untrammeled. We've seen 40 years of wars to establish its hegemony and resource control abroad. It's led to the economic implosion about to hit us. Well, I couldn't put it better than the Honourable Craig Murray. I won't try. Let me go all the way to Bali, where it literally is the middle of the night. But our guest is good enough, noble enough, to rise from his slumbers to address us on matters Far Eastern. Well, it depends where you are in the world as to whether it's Far Eastern. Carl, thank you. As always, Carl Zha, the host of Silk and Steel, which is a podcast about China 
Silk Road, History, Culture and Geopolitics. Let's start with the geopolitics, Carl. The American Navy is right now steaming in the Straits of Taiwan. How's that going down? You know, at this point, this is almost a uh, pretty regular occurrence. U.S. sent two warships uh, into Taiwan Strait, but they're very careful not sending their capital ship, which is their aircraft carrier, into the Taiwan Strait, like they have done back in 1997, 1996. And, and the two warships they sent, though, they're, they're th uh, 35 year old and 38 year old. So they're not going to intimidate anybody, and it's certainly not the Chinese. Uh, this, U.S. is just doing this now as an act of provocation. See, I can do this, and and you know because I I can claim I'm sailing uh, in just because I, I I can. This is just a just a way to annoy China even more. Ever after the Pelosi visit, and now after uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn's visit, U United States just trying to do anything you can to get a rise out of China at this point. The Chinese leadership has proved uh, patient, sagacious, uh, and, uh, and is waiting for its time. When do you think that time might be? Well, you know, some in the United States uh, government, they think U.S. have a very limited time window to, to confront China now because they believe in 10, 15 years, China econo economy will grow to such a point where even U.S. want to contain China at that point, it will not be possible. So the thought is now or never. They, they think if they have to do something to contain China's rise, they have to do it now. And that, that is why we see these series of provocations. Uh, first with uh, Pelosi's visit, now with uh, Blackburn, and now the, the ship sailing into the Taiwan Strait. Uh, China is not taking the bait because Time is on China's side. You know, China has been very patient. You waited 70 years to resolve the Taiwan issue. China can't afford another to wait another 10, 20 years uh, when its position will even be stronger vis-a-vis -vis United States. Um, so we're, we're going to see China is actually acting like the adult in the room here now. Um, I mean, we, there's actually a recent article in the Foreign uh, Policy magazine uh, says the majority of the Indo-Pacific regions support China in this latest confrontation over Taiwan. Of course they do, because most people here, they just want to do business with China. There's no reason for, um, for the uncalled for provocation to increase tension by United States. Uh, but but U.S. doesn't care at this point uh, because they think they have a very top limited time window to do something. Well, look, amongst those keen to do business with China are, of course, our own Western companies. I once uh, had a debate against Steve Bannon, the former Trump guy, uh, who's a fanatic uh, anti-China man. Uh, if, you, if you offered him a place on the bridge of a warship going down the Yangtze, all guns blazing, Bannon would take it. He... Uh, was talking about how China had stolen uh, everybody's lunch, but I pointed out, actually it was the Western capitalists that stole your lunch. It was them that upsticked and moved their uh, manufacturing and their investments to China. Some of the biggest companies in the world, in the Western world, brand names known to everyone, are heavily involved in the Chinese economy. So how do you account for this dichotomy? Uh, that's, that's right, uh, George, because if China, for their perspective, it's built it, they will come. And they have built up their infrastructure. They, they have educated a, a well-educated workforce. And this is why the Western multinational has been rushing into China in a gold rush since 1980s. And what have changed recently, though, is, um, you know, if you look at the stock market, most of our, uh, the, the, in the S&P, the most value companies now are Western technology companies. You know, we're talking about Facebook, Google, 
Apple. Now, Apple is doing brisk business in China, but there are companies like Facebook and Google that's not in the Chinese market, and and they see Ch- Chinese tech giant like Tencent, like Huawei, as competition. So you know that's that's why we're seeing U.S. is trying to、uh, force China a Chinese company TikTok to to sell off the company, for example, in United States. That started under Trump and still ongoing, and so. Increasingly, a lot of the U.S. companies, especially high tech companies, they see chi- Chinese uh, uh, product and companies are offering them real competition, and that's something they don't like to see. And and these、uh, fan companies, you know, Facebook, Apple,、uh, Google, etc., they have a lot of、uh, sway in Washington.、Uh, you know, before. U.S. business lobby are all for doing business in China. You know that's why at least. At some point, there was a balance between the so-called pro-containment camp and、uh, pro-engagement camp. And since Donald Trump, what we have seen is the pro-engagement camp pretty much evaporated. Now it's all—it's、uh, pretty much the U.S. military is calling the shots right now. It's the Pentagon that's setting force agenda in the U.S.-China relationship, and that is why we're seeing seeing the warship sailings through the Taiwan Strait right now. Well, here's another contradiction. Amongst those doing great business with China is Taiwan. Not a lot of people know that, Carl. That hundreds of millions of dollars of trade goes across the 100 miles in the Straits of Taiwan. There are huge Chinese investments in Taiwan and huge Taiwanese investment in China. There are. Untold thousands of Taiwanese people working and living in China. Explain.、Uh, that's right, George.、Uh, as a matter of fact, there's at least two million Taiwanese people work,、uh, live on mainland China. That's out of a po- island population of 25 million. So we're talking about almost 10 percent of the population in Taiwan have moved to mainland China to work and live. And if Taiwan's、um, economy is heavily dependent on doing business with mainland China,、uh, uh, as as much as forty percent of Taiwanese exports goes to mainland China directly.、Uh, but this is this is something that's rarely reported. It's kind of the economic dependency、uh, on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. What U.S. Fail to mention, for example, when they talk about sending U.S. Navy into South China Sea to、uh, quote unquote protecting the international sea lane, what they're not telling you is over eighty percent of the trade going through South China Sea is going to or from China. So U.S. Navy essentially is claiming they're protecting the Chinese shipping lane from China, right? And and it's utterly ridiculous. And and right now,、um, U.S. actually has a law that prohibits the Taiwan、uh, main Taiwan semiconductor company TSMC from selling their semiconductor chips to Huawei, right? A main Chinese technology company. Now, this is U.S. has no business. This is U.S. dictating an entire region now who they can or cannot do business with. Uh, but this is how U.S. act around the world, you know, for past no how many ever years. I mean, because U.S. is a bully, right? U.S. felt it, it can dictate to the whole world. Taiwan TSMC is perfectly willing to continue to sell semiconductor chips to mainland China, but U.S. is saying no. If you do that, we are going to put sanction on you. You cannot do business in United States. You know, we, we will prevent pre- prevent. U.S. companies like、uh, you know, like Facebook, Amazon, to source their chips to from to Taiwan. So now, United States is the main factor of instability in East Asia right now. The China used to have two Achilles heels. One was energy, in which it is energy poor,、uh, or was less now. Doing very well with wind and other alternative、uh, energy sources, but but fossil fuel uh, uh, energy 
is a weak point for them, but their ultra close relationship with not just Russia, where the two countries are more or less now one, but also with Iran and Venezuela means they've closed that gap. They're no longer vulnerable on the energy front. But semiconductors, they appear still to be vulnerable. How, how come? Why is that? And what are they trying to do about it? Um, that's correct, George, because uh, for the longest time, uh, ever since the Sino-US reapprochement under Richard Nixon, China had tried to join the US-dominated global world order. And, and China benefited from that globalization. And the, the, the thinking is that we, you know, China can always source its semiconductors. It can always buy, mainland China can always buy semiconductors from Taiwan. That has been the case until the Trump administration comes to power and said, no, you cannot do that anymore. Um, because the US has identified semiconductor as one of the few areas where they can potentially still have a chokehold over China. But this is gonna be, again, it's gonna be temporary because um, China is now plowing billions, billions of investment into its own semiconductor um, manufacturing sector. Uh, be, before they can, they are perfectly content to to source it from from uh, a third party. But now they know that uh, it's a strategic commodity. They must have control it over themselves. So I expect in five to ten years, uh, maybe less, maybe five years, China will resolve the semiconductor manufacturing problem and and will no longer be dependent on um, on Taiwan, which creates actually an issue for Taiwan because Taiwan semiconductor um, TSMC is one of the main economic stays on Taiwan. You know, they're going to, they're potentially going to lose one of their biggest customers because of the U.S. government policies. But this is a weakness and a criticism of uh, previous Chinese leaderships uh, that they allowed a situation to arise where Taiwan could be a world leader in semiconductors, but China had no uh, capacity to manufacture those. How much effort is now going into catching up? Oh, there's, there's tons of money being plowed into um, semiconductor manufacturing in China right now. Uh, they, the, there's a couple bottle points, uh, specifically um, in, in terms of equipment that needed to manufacturing uh, the semiconductor at at a, um, at at high precision. Now this is where U.S. also again comes in. They prevent the European company AS, uh, ASML from selling their machines to China. So 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 now China is not going to only not only they have to figure out the uh, semiconductor manufacturing process. They also need to figure out how they can create their own machines to, to, to do so. I mean, so that's why I expect it to take five to 10 years. But uh, with the amount of money China is plowing into semiconductor field, I don't expect this to be an issue 10 years from now. Carl Zhao, as always, thank you, especially uh, given the hour in Indonesia, in Bali, and my good wife Gayatri says hi to you and your family. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Omas donated five euros, says keeping it real, George, 45,000 Ukrainian immigrants in Ireland. I've just lost that. And Femi Okenie donated five pounds and says you are an inspiration to many of us. Uh, Femi, it's been too long. Very nice to hear from you again. And thank you very much indeed for that donation. There are quite a few above that. Johnny Blue Eyes donates H-U-F. That's Hungarian Florence. How about that? Our very first Hungarian Florence. And 45,000 of them. That sounds like a lot, Omas. I'm going to quickly find out how many that is. Uh, uh, and uh, that was Johnny Blue Eyes. Um, Hi, George. I live in Hungary. We're the only country in the EU to keep out of the war. 
and we now have enough gas for the coming winter and the cheapest gas, electric and fuel in Europe. Food for thought. Best regards, John. Well, John, I hope the currency is flourishing and the 4,000 Hungarian uh, <laughs> florins is worth a fair amount. Kathleen Bonnelem donated one pound. Thank you, Kathleen. Don't be shy about donating one pound, please. And Maggie Dury donated 50 British pounds. Maggie, God bless you, my love. Now, let me see. I misread that uh, uh, Ireland one. Omas donated five euros and says, keeping it real, George, 45,000 Ukrainian immigrants in Ireland. I've met two. As a taxi driver, I should be meeting them every day. Strange. Well, I don't know how many there really are in Ireland or how many there really are in Britain. I see that a cleric was the other day comparing them to economic migrants, rather like my own grandparents, uh, rather than political refugees. I saw some of the most expensive cars I've ever seen in my life with Ukrainian plates driving across Europe over the, coast of the co course of the summer. I guarantee you this. This I guarantee you. Remember that you heard it here. I guarantee you this. That within the next five to ten years, Ukraine will overtake Kosovo as the biggest single source of crime of vice, of drugs, and of illegal weapons on the street in Western European countries. Remember you heard it from me, and remember you heard it on the mother of all talk shows. Have I got time? I do for some uh, calls right after this break. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that I literally bent double. Then after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament it was war. Every one of his papers the Daily Mirror then following the Sunday Mirror the Sunday People the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned. All over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. The, the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell, the monster. You said, what is my secret? I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining, it means nothing to me. You should sign up for that Patreon page. I'm now entirely dependent, uh, well, not entirely, but apart from my pension, uh, dependent on my Patreon supporters, and I'm deeply grateful to them. So are my hungry children. Uh, so patreon.com uh, forward slash George Galloway, that's the 
uh, destination that you should look for. Uh, if you want more copy, more uh, product, more uh, content, like the Maxwell mini documentary, you can also get my football podcast on there. And more and more material is going up on my Patreon page. It's not even the price of a cup of tea in the most insalubrious cafe. I really hope that you will give some consideration to uh, following me there, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now, let's hear from Tom in London. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, g'day, George. Yeah, I'm just in London and I wanted to uh, use your voice to amplify the call we put out to get all supporters of Julian Assange to the Parliament Square on the 8th of October to protest the incarceration of one of the world's greatest journalists. 8th of October at what time, Tom? 1pm. I'll be there game. and I encourage everyone to be there. It is uh, the 11th hour and the 59th minute. All must rally to save the life of Julian Assange. Tom, thanks for that call. Uh, now, I'll be speaking at the TUC uh, Trade Union Congress for younger viewers and overseas viewers. Once upon a time, everybody knew what TUC meant and all roads led to the TUC conference. But I'll be speaking at a fringe meeting uh, entitled the TUC and Keir Starmer's Labour Party, along with Andy Hudd, uh, who is the Vice President of the Train Drivers Union, ASLEF, asl -E &F, one of my oldest allies. And it's chaired by Jason Turvey, uh, who is the leader of the Workers' Party, which I lead. He's the leader of its trade union group. You don't have to be a delegate or even visitor to the TUC in Brighton uh, to attend that meeting. Uh, but you uh, can attend it as a member of the public. If you're anywhere near uh, the uh, TUC in Brighton, that that I can see on my screen doesn't tell you even the date, never mind the venue. I'm sure we'll be able to uh, deal with that before the end of the show. Let's go to line two, where Giza wants to talk about protests in Downing Street. On you go, Giza. How are you doing, mate? It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And thank you for Tom for putting on to the guy that's just speaking on. Uh, I will certainly be there on the 8th of October. Now, I've been down to uh, at the protest pen, the official protest pen. They're supposed to sterilise protests and send you over the street. Uh, we've got a stage down here, three blackboards, uh, and all of it to do with... Uh, uh, Boris Johnson and uh, the, the tre treacherous government. Uh, the very first uh, uh, item I put up on the blackboard was arrest Boris Johnson for treason and genocide. And just look where we are now. After uh, uh, Sunak's uh, uh, announcement yesterday about the we shouldn't be listening to the experts, we've now got other stations. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the other stations that are now saying we should be arresting uh, the likes of uh, Chris Whitty and others. Uh, the main reason I'm here is to highlight the fact that the uh, patients uh, were overdosed in 2020 by hydroxychloroquine. Um, this has got me barred from Facebook on numerous occasions for 30 days. They were overdosed by 2,400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine when the safe dose is 400 and it cured COVID. It was proven by Dr. Zelenko in America. Uh, the toxic uh, level is 1,000 milligrams uh, uh, and uh, so, the, first of all, they, Oxford University overlooked the recovery trial study uh, and then also are now, con conflict of interest, are in with the AstraZeneca that is now uh, paying out 100, uh, well, the yeah, government paying out 120,000. This is all, uh, Giza, this is all utter gobbledygook. And I'm sorry that you have abused uh, this program to make these kind of wild and utterly irrational statements. Personally, I don't even know what you are talking about. And I'm sure I speak 
for many of the audience. Let's hear from Mohammed in Glasgow, where you get a better class of color. Go ahead, Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum, George. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. What would you like to say, Mohammed? Uh, my brother, I know time is short, so I would just say one thing to mark what you do with about um, Julian Assange and the Philist- about Philistine. Uh, all I can say is the caravan keeps moving on and the dogs keep on barking. That's my first comment. Hope you like that one. Uh, yep. George, I, 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 I've loved that one all, all my life. Oh, nice. I'm glad to hear it. George, regarding uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine, you know, we all saw that um, Alexander Dugin's daughter was uh, shockingly assassinated uh, in a horrific attack in Moscow. Uh, My simple question to you, George, is what do you think Russia's response will be now? Because I doubt they will not respond in some sort of way. Well, I doubt if the state will respond. It certainly won't do publicly. Uh, Putin has never met Alexander Dugin, never spoken to him, despite the lie machine pumping out endless lies that he's Putin's brain, his right-hand man. He's never met him or spoken to him, let alone his young daughter. An utterly blameless young woman that was torn to pieces in a car bomb attack that would have been condemned if, say, it had been uh, Salman Rushdie's car and Salman Rushdie's daughter uh, that was torn to pieces. We would never hear the end of that. We never heard the beginning of any outrage about the murder of Daria Dugan. Uh, I doubt if Russia will officially respond as a state, but I know for sure that there will be a response and the uh, murderers who have identified themselves and their whereabouts uh, will undoubtedly come to a sticky end, probably not dissimilar to the end that Daria herself experienced. Uh, Mohammed, last point to you. Well, I totally agree with that, George, and uh, all all I can really say is I I thank you for everything you do, and uh, you have my full support, sir. Wajib, Wajib, thank you, Mohammed. God bless Glasgow and your uh, community. Uh, Now, uh, I need to uh, remind you uh, about the 7th of November at the Garrick Theatre. Abraham Lincoln got shot in a theatre. I hope nobody's thinking of that in my case, because I have a lot of security there, uh, led by my good friend Shen and his team, who are uh, red hot in terms of security. I'll be on the stage for 45 minutes, uh, talking, making you laugh, making you cry, making you angry, making you excited, making you hopeful. And then there'll be a break, and then you will have the chance to ask me questions. In between times, Gayatri will be going around with our camera interviewing as many of you in Vox Pops as she can. So if you want to be on the mother of all talk shows, get to the Garrick Theatre in Stockport on the 7th of November. But a word of warning, there's only 151 seats and we've already sold almost half of the seats. So get buying them quickly. They're only 10 quid. It's worth it. Uh, Eve is in Idaho. First call from the United States. Go ahead, Eve. Hello, George. Thank you for having me on your great show. Uh, I I wanted to to talk about uh, racism and and, and things related to that. And it is a very... uh, um, I I have always believed that racism was not inherent uh, to the human race. Uh, I think the genetic proves it. And the event of Ukraine prove, prove also that the West used for their propaganda racism when the goal is completely different. What I'm trying to say is that the bottom line with Ukraine is that America 
uh, once the, geo, uh, the geopolitical monopoly of their currency and so on, that's well known. But Europe was told by Americans that they should steal the wealth from Russia because Russia is 2% of the population of the world and 20% of the reserve. When Europe is a post neocolonial -neo power, they have no energy, they have no money, they are lazy, they have high standard of living, they have a tradition to steal uh, in Africa and so on, and now they want to destroy Russia and they will use Ukraine or anything, or in fact, they, they are using Ukraine, Kosovo, and Syria. But what's interesting is the thing with racism, because Russophobia is racism. And we know that uh, the media thinks that we cannot admit that we want to, that we are thieves, that we just want to steal. So we think that Russophobia uh, would be okay. And we use, uh, we use uh, the, the Russophobia and what I call racism, a form of racism, to conceal the fact that Europe is a neocolonial power and we are a bunch of thieves. That's what I wanted to say. Well, uh, look, uh, it's very good, very powerful. I agree with all of it. But the uh, good news, Eve, is that it has completely failed. They moved heaven and earth to put in power in Damascus, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the alphabet soup of Islamist fanaticism, and they completely failed. The Serbian people will ensure that they fail in Kosovo. And trust me, NATO is not going to go to war against Serbia. Because if they do, they'll be at war with Russia's closest ally in the near abroad. They will not do that. The Kosovan people should know that, need to know that. And to say that they have failed in the Ukraine is a very considerable understatement. I thought the picture as a man, a man of French ethnicity yourself, albeit in Idaho, the picture of the foreign legion arriving in Yemen to steal Yemen's gas reserves, summed it up. Thieves, pirates, brigands, who all, if they are not very lucky, return home to their various countries in boxes. Trust me on that. I know the Yemeni people very, very well. Richard is in Wales, wants to talk about fuel duties as well. He might. Richard, go ahead, sir. Hi, George. Good evening. Health and strength to you, my buddy. Um, yes. Thank you, brother. Uh, as a former member of parliament, um, you may have the knowledge to either substantiate or refute my suspicions uh, that I have about the government today. Um, okay. I'm going to reuse a phrase that you use, I smell a rat. I suspect yeah. that the government are and have been doing since the beginning of the fuel increases, deliberately avoiding to detax transport fuel because they themselves are in turn receiving a much needed windfall from that tax. Is, are my suspicions right or wrong or I don't know? Uh, I'm absolutely right. But uh, of course, you never know what the last straw is going to be or you wouldn't, la you wouldn't load it on the camel's back. And what we now have is a perfect storm. We have rising food prices. We have shortages, even one or two products that I myself regularly use, I can no longer get, unavailability in the marketplace, rocketing prices, fuel duty, which has not been cut, fueling an historic increase in the price of uh, diesel and petrol, despite the claims that the chancellor as was Rishi Sunak had told the companies to cut it and had cut the fuel duty by five pence and so on. It's still now over 180. 
uh, far more expensive than it was uh, when I was buying diesel across Europe over the uh, summer. But the big enchilada, Richard, is that now adding to this perfect storm is the fact that electricity and gas prices have become and are becoming not just difficult to pay, but unpayable, literally unpayable. No one can pay, no pensioner can spend three quarters of their pension on their gas and electricity. I mean, it, it's a no-brainer, that one, isn't it? No poor person can pay more than half of their weekly income on gas or electricity. Anyone who went quietly into that good night would need their head examined. All these people need is a lead. They need a leader. They need leaders to say enough is enough. Can't pay, won't pay. That's what they need. They need leaders. And if those leaders come forward, then the people will follow in their millions. I was one of the refuseniks that refused to pay their poll tax. The bailiffs raided my home in Glasgow and put my furniture, or tried to, out on the uh, pavement, the sidewalk, to sell it to passers-by to recover the money from my poll tax. The anti-poll tax campaigners uh, rallied and stopped the bailiffs from doing so, but the poll tax brought down Margaret Thatcher. And I believe this crisis is going to bring down this Tory government. If only the so-called opposition would lead the people. I've got to go, Richard, because there's a legend on the line. And we've missed her these last weeks. It's the one and only Norma in Bristol. Last call. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, um, it's been quite interesting, actually, but what I did want to say was just quickly I'm very worried about Pakistan because it's in a bad way really and Imran Khan although he's got thousands of supporters um, wants an election it's not good and now with these awful floods um, I just thousands are dying in these floods thousands yeah no and it's just uh, well you know it's like a double whammy in that country it's not good is it you got a political crisis allied to a uh, catastrophe in yeah. uh, climate, environmental damage. Thousands have been killed. Hundreds were killed today. Hundreds killed yesterday. I've seen video of people yeah. being swept away to their deaths, their families desperately trying to hold on to them. Everyone should rally to the assistance of the yeah. people of Pakistan, but at the same time, keep up the pressure for the political reform that is required, the first reform of which is free and fair general elections to That's elect right, a yeah. government chosen by the people. Thank you very much, Norma. Sorry the hour is late. Are you prepared to pay for the Ukraine war through increased energy prices on twitter yes nine no 91 on youtube yes six no 94 on telegram yes three no 97 wow across the day ten thousand people nearly voted on that poll and overwhelmingly rejected it now i'm writing the third of this Trilogy, which is called Killarney Bluff, which is a double entendre. It's the Queensway series. This is the first one. This is the sequel. And I'm writing part three now. The film rights are still available. If anyone in Hollywood wants to buy them up, you can get both these books for $8.99 plus postage and packaging can get them from my shop or from Amazon. Well, look, that's all 
I've got time for. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, join me on Wednesday for The Galloway Show, only on YouTube at 10 p.m. UK time. Or, and or, for next week's Mother of All Talk Shows at 7 p.m. UK on all platforms. Thank you for watching.